Well, the challenge of this passage was pretty simple, if you heard it. Uh, Do not repay evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, bless. It's very simple to understand, very simple to read, very simple to remember, but very hard to do. It's hard to bless someone who says something mean to you. Uh, The PR firm Weber Shandwick does a study every year on civility in America, and I would imagine this will shock none of you. Incivility is on the rise in America. That surveys say that uncoolness is at epidemic levels, (laughs) that we're not nice to each other, that it's a more hostile environment than ever before. And the vast number of people in America that were surveyed about it said, I run into incivility on the daily in my commute while shopping and at work. So basically everywhere. And yet it was interesting when they were asked, are you always polite and civil? 94% of those surveyed said, of course. (laughs) Of course I am. You're like, wow, so if 94% of us are nice, where's all the incivility coming from? (laughs) Survey says, those in politics and those on social media. Those are the top two answers. So if you work in politics or you're on social media, Basically, it's all your fault. So this sermon is just for us. Apparently, the rest of America is fine. Uh, but here in this room, we've got to figure some things out. Uh, because I don't know about you. Maybe you're among the 94% that's always kind. Uh, but I've preached so many messages recently about this concept because it shows up in the words of Jesus and in Paul and Peter. All through the Bible, we're called not to curse people, but to bless, not to revile, but to speak life to them. That We're called to love our enemies, pray for those who persecute us. So I've given several sermons on this basic concept, told you a lot of inspiring stories, given you a lot of compelling stats. And so even this week, I was like, Lord, I've told all the stories about how to bless your enemies, the power that it can do, the transformational element of the supernatural life. I've talked about that. How can I even illustrate this? And I was driving through town trying to think about how to illustrate this concept to you, but I was having a hard time focusing. And finally, I was like, why can I not focus on this sermon? And I realized it was because my mind was kept replaying a different sermon. Uh, Because what I realized was the day before someone said something that hurt my feelings and it offended me. And I did that thing I imagine some of you do where, you know, in the moment, you're just sort of shocked when someone says something rude to you. So what happens? The next day, you replay it with what you would have said. (laughs) And what you would have said is not normally, well, bless you and your children and your family to generations and your children and your children. That's not what you're saying. What you're saying is, okay, all right? And then you start enumerating all the places where their points were wrong, all the assumptions that were false. You start enumerating things that are true. And then you start moving deeper into personally how they're stupid. They probably got some mechanics in their brain that have gone wrong. And so they shouldn't even use their mouth because they say things that are dumb. And you start to do all this stuff where you just want to what? Destroy and revile in return. And I was sitting there in my car and I was like, oh, I'm mad at what this person said to me. And I'm imagining me rebuking them, not, not to instruct them, to help them to live a more informed life. I, I want to win. And then I just thought, Lord, you're doing it again. You're making me live this message. I don't like when you do this. I want to preach it to these people. So anyway, I've had to preach this message to myself this week, and now I'm going to preach it to you. And uh, I- I'll tell you something. Uh, personally, it works. Okay, So hang with me. My goal is to bother you and then to hopefully release you to live a better way. Because the truth is, the world is a difficult place. And in 1 Peter, this is talking about in the early church, people who had come to faith in Jesus Christ, found themselves in their city um, in, the, in the minority, that a number of people didn't hold their same view. And often when you're a part of a community that has a minority view, you can be misunderstood and then misaligned because of that. And that was happening to people. Their faith in Jesus was costing them socially. And and look, Open Doors USA is an organization that that does a a, a watch list every year of persecutions, specifically of Christians around the world. And this may shock some of you, persecution of Christians is on the rise around the world. That the number of people murdered because of their faith in Jesus Christ rose 24% uh, from year to year last year, according to their uh, staff. Uh, over 4,000 in, in Nigeria. Uh, Af- North Korea, which was, 
usually the number one spot of oppression of Christians, lost its number one spot to Afghanistan. That as the Taliban took over, uh, members of the Taliban were going door to door in towns looking for, among other people, Christians to persecute. So Christianity is facing persecution globally, and, and we here in America don't face it like that. Uh, not like some of our brothers and sisters are in other countries. And yet some of you know what that's like to have an allegiance to Jesus Christ and be worried that you'll be misunderstood in your office or in your home. Some of you have felt that. My allegiance to Jesus has made people misunderstand me and maybe at times make fun of me. Some of you were ostracized socially in high school and in college or at your office because of your allegiance to Jesus. And Peter is writing to people who are being uh, insulted and telling them, you don't insult back. The people of Jesus have a different way. What do you do when someone disagrees with you? Do you rage against them? The Christian goes another way. And the question is, how do we do it? And what we're gonna get into here is he's gonna talk about the qualities and activities needed by the people of Jesus to sustain their community in the midst of hostility. How do we do it? And he's gonna tell them there's some qualities you need to possess and then some activities you need to pursue, and then a perspective that you need to hold, right? So the posture he's gonna give us, if you want the points ahead of time, he's gonna advocate a posture, namely of loving the family. Then he's gonna give you a practice of blessing your enemy. And then he's gonna give you a perspective about how you hope in God. So he's gonna call us to look inward, look out, and then look up, got it? So that's where we're going. So to start, he gives us this posture that we're meant to love the family. That before you step out to bless your enemies, God has built a community and you need to love them well. So in verse eight, he says, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart and a humble mind. He says all of you, because he's widening the lens. Uh, if you were with us the last couple of weeks, he was talking to specific groups, husbands, wives, employees, employers, different kind of people. Now he pulls back and says, hey, all of you, all of you in the believing community. So he's talking to the church. He's talking to the family that is an allegiance to Jesus Christ. And he's saying, God has brought you into his family. What I need you to do is I need you to have particular qualities as you interact with each other. The world may be a hostile place. It shouldn't be hostile here. The, you may face cruelty out there, you shouldn't hear. I say these sorts of things to my kids all the time when they bicker among each other. I say, hey, this is home team. You get each other's backs. That's what brothers and sisters do. A lot of hard things may happen in the world, but you gotta always support each other. And that's where he starts. Before you try to radiate love out into the world, you gotta have a, a white hot burning community of love on the inside. You need that heat of community that can radiate out to blessing into hostility. You see it? So he starts by telling them to focus on home base, have these qualities among each other. And he does something wild here because he picks qualities that were common to use in Greco-Roman writing, the, the, the day he was writing, but it was always used to family. This is how you treat family. This is how you treat blood. This is how you treat people who are of your uh, same ethnicity. This is this community. And he takes that language and he pulls it out and says, this is how you treat people in the family of Jesus Christ. It was kind of wild to do at the time that God is building a multi-ethnic family because of the finished work of Jesus and, and this, these family qualities of brotherhood and suffering with each other and co-passion that extends now to your broader Christian community, the people who have allegiance to Jesus. Uh, one of my favorite names of a restaurant in DC is Kinship. I don't know if the food's any good or not. I haven't been there yet. You can tell me later. But I like the name Kinship, right? That we're family here. And he takes all that family energy and aims it at the people of Jesus. God is a father. He purchased a family. We're meant to love each other. This is the inner ring. This is the strong core. You got a strong core, you can lift all kinds of stuff. Don't have a strong core, you're going to break in half. And he says, make sure the core of your community is strong, your family. And so he gives us these five qualities you're meant to have. He says, have unity of mind or have one mind. That doesn't mean you think everything alike. That doesn't mean we're all robots in here but it means you have a common vision and common values. That when you come to Jesus Christ, you, you get on the same page as the people of Jesus. What, what he had been advocating earlier, we are God's own possession to proclaim the glories of him who called us out of darkness into his light. That's what we're meant to do. God brought us into his family so we can extend his grace out as a community to the world. That's what God did. He showed his love to us so that we can show it to them. 
that we are God's possession to proclaim his grace to the world. And he says, I just want you to have that same vision, that same value set. He wants for us as a Christian community to have what every team wants. Every team you're on from your work team to pickleball. I don't know what your team is. Every team wants this, unity of mind. We're on the same page. Uh, I was at a Broadway show uh, Friday night and uh, the dancing was amazing. But when you're there, yes, you're all individuals. Yes, you all have styles. But if everyone's in the middle of a hip hop sequence and you choose to cha-cha, it doesn't matter if it's real smooth. Get on the same page. (laughs) Get in line, man, because you're messing up the show, right? And so the same idea is here that, that, hey, if we have an allegiance with Jesus, Jesus has a mission, we need to get on the same page. Uh, He's using the same language from Romans 15, uh, which was Donna and I's theme verse at at our wedding. Uh, It's a prayer that Paul says, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another that in one accord with Christ Jesus, together you with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you've met my wife, Donna, you know we are different. We have a different set of skills. We have different things we're great at. We have different personalities. We're different. But in terms of why we exist and what we're here for, lockstep. Because we're a team. And that's the idea here. Before you extend out to the world, we got to get family right. We got to get team right. We got to be on the same page. God has a mission here. So I don't know whose vision or what values shape you. But if it's not Jesus Christ, he's saying, hey, get on this page. If you are his child, get on board with what your father is doing. You see it? And so part of that is that you have sympathy. That's sympathos, that uh, pathos is pain, that I suffer with you, that your pain is my pain. That's the page believers are on. If we're family, then if you suffer, I suffer, right? Jesus had this, uh, Hebrews 4 says, we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus Christ didn't need the hassle of you or me, but he sympathizes with us, sympathos. I'm I'm stepping into your pain with you. If you hurt, I hurt. So I can be there with you in your weakness. And we're meant to do the same. That, That sympathy feeling for each other is meant to become action. Hebrews 10 says that. You had compassion on those in prison. Same word, sympathy. And you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and abiding one. Fascinating story. He's saying there were people who were jailed for their faith. And you knew if I associate with them, my wider community will reject me and steal all my property. And you go, I don't need to hassle them. I can duck my head, not associate with Jesus or those people. And yet, if you suffer, I suffer. So you knew what it would cost you to love them. And you joyfully accepted it because you, you, you knew you had a better possession than an abiding one. We're meant to do the same. First Corinthians says that if one suffers, all suffers. We're a family. And we're a family, so he says, have brotherly love. That's the next one. Uh, Philadelphia, that's what that means, right? That I have affection with you like you're my family. That's what we were called to at the beginning of First Peter. He says that God called us to a sincere brotherly love that's not fake. And he says, because God called you into that, do it. Because Jesus purchased a family with his blood, love us like family, right? And that means have a tender heart. That's, a, that's the next one. That we have a tender heart towards each other. Uh, that's the word uh, splachna, good intestines. It's a beautiful word. It's one of my favorites because it's, it's beautiful. You know, back then they would assign emotions to different body parts. And we do the same thing. If you say I had a gut reaction or I had a visceral response, what does that mean? That means I saw something and I reacted, not just intellectually, I interacted with my viscera, with my guts, that it hit me at a deep level. And usually that is, precedes action. That I see that and I can't stay still. That moved me at a deep place and I gotta move. And so he says, hey, believer, the world's gonna be a hostile place, but in here is home. The world's gonna have hardship, but here's your family. And I want you to treat them like family. So let's get on the same page to care, have co-passion with each other. That that's your brother, that's your sister. Look around and love those people. Just take a minute right now and look around. Can we do that? Can we have an active participation? Look around just real quick, real quick. Handful of people, front row's doing it. The rest of you have unsure. But uh, yeah, he says, you're meant to see these people if they were in Christ as family. That I love them like I'd love a brother or a sister. He says that I want you to have uh, you splachna, that, that I am moved by wanting your good. 
I want to see good in your life. I want to see blessing come your way. This is how the Christian is meant to respond to the family. We had a wonderful story. We, we gather together with our door holders, those who serve in our house beforehand uh, to pray and prepare. Uh, we don't smoke weed. I know some of you with the smell in here are wondering that. You're like, what do you do in that rally? <laughs> no, that was earlier uh, with a different group. But we get together before the gathering starts and we tell stories about Jesus moving our life. And uh, I didn't even ask you this, Chizzy. I'm gonna tell your story if that's okay. You would tell it better. But um, I was telling a story just a couple weeks ago where she was talking about how she had to, to move rather suddenly as happens here. Hey, I gotta make some shifts in where I live and realizing that, man, this is coming fast. I don't have a lot of the materials. I got nothing in place for this. And somebody in the church community found out Somebody told somebody. She showed up here at church. And, uh, you know, I was giving our brothers in Christ a hard time last week, but one of our brothers in Christ walked up to her and said, hey, I've been tasked with your move today. And she's like, tasked with it? What? You know, and uh, he's like, let's get this done. And just marshaled a bunch of the men in our house. And they moved her right away from A to B, wherever you need to go. And she said, I'm watching these people. Yeah, exactly. I had a friend say that once. If you want to see if you really are a loving person, buy a pickup truck. You'll know if you're a real loving person then. Because suddenly everyone will call you, hey man, what are you doing Saturday? And uh, these dudes roll up and she was like, man, I was watching these people move my furniture, blew up a whole day, blew up vacation, blew up whatever they could be doing. And she's like, you know what? I didn't know all of them. There were several people there that don't know me. All they knew was sister and need. And they were like, well, let's go. That's family. We had another sister earlier today. She was standing here talking about how she went into labor uh, for her baby and stayed in labor for 72 hours. Lord have mercy. <laughs> and so somewhere around, I don't know, day three, she said, I need to call somebody because she called the hospital and they said, sorry, we're full up. Come back later when like the baby's almost here. I don't know what they told her. It was crazy. So she's at home like, all right, I'm having a kid. I don't know how to do this. And so finally she realized, why am I not calling my Christian family? So she called the oldest people at our church. I'm just kidding, Doug. Uh, but <laughs> you know, hey, she called this couple like, what do I do? And they were like, well, what you do is you call earlier than three days in is what you do. And they kind of gently chided her for waiting this long. And then some other couples called to coach her through. Other couples were calling to give her some uh, different people to give advice. Uh, other people were saying, what, what do we need? And she said, man, they, they took care of us, got us where we needed to go. And she said, and then the email started of just flooding us with Grubhub cards and Uber Eats. And she said, and we didn't have to worry about or pay for a meal for weeks. That when we were in this moment of we don't know what to do, the family came surging towards us. And she's like, and a lot of them I didn't even know. And you go, you know what? That's what family does. That's kinship. That, that's how you survive a hostile world is you know you got a home to come back to. And so before Peter says, go love your enemy, go pray for those who persecute you, you don't have to derive all that strength from internally you. When he says, look in, he says, look in here. Look in this family. You got a family here that loves each other. And from this burning, raging flame, then love and grace and mercy can radiate out even to people who aren't being nice. You see that? So let me encourage you and preach a little bit here before I move on. Let me say this. If you don't know what that feels like, the grace of Jesus Christ is free. You don't do anything to earn it. The love of God flies first towards you. But community require something from you. T to really build community means I have to have co-passion with other people. Sympathos, I hurt with you. I gotta have a tender heart towards you. It involves the sacrifice of you for the sake of other. And if you're like, well, that sounds like a hassle. I don't wanna do that. Well, then you won't have it. We understand that concept with working out. Well, I want all those muscles, but I don't wanna like exercise. I don't like the taste of vegetables. God, you don't have to eat vegetables. You don't have to work out. But then if you can't climb the highest mountains, don't be surprised. Because there is an effort and deprivation to get you the ability to climb those heights. And we live in a generation now that's so lonely. And the statistics out there are alarming at how isolated we all feel. And yet here Peter's saying is God is forging a family. So how do you build love? How you build love is you love others. You, you have co-passion, sympathos. You, you have a tender heart. You lean into others. Well, that sounds like a hassle. Yeah, but on the other side of that hassle is a home. 
And when you love us, you find we love you back. And, and uh, we'll love you first because the gospel flies first that way. But if you're like, man, I don't have that sense of community, I would say jump into it. Uh, jump into that community, prioritize it, make it a value to be a part of the people of Jesus, whether this city is your home or some other one. Find a community where you can tangibly meet the needs of others. And you might just be surprised that it's true. It's better to give than receive. You'll get in a community, you go, man, I'm blessed in a way I didn't expect when I chose to dive into this family and love them well. So that's where he starts, right? That's our posture. We love the family. Uh, And then out of that abundance, it's easier to share. And we know this, right? It's easier to share when you have a lot, okay? You got a basket of cookies from Levain. You want a cookie? You want a cookie? You want one? You just got one cookie left? Kind of putting it in your backpack. (laughs) Zip it up, save it for later, right? You get a scarcity mentality. But you're in a loving community, it's easier to spread love. So he starts by looking in. But now we got to look out. What do we do with the person who was mean to you? Here's where it gets tough. You bless your enemy. I love the family. And then from that place, I radiate out blessing to my enemy. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. This is apparently the whole reason for the letter. Peter's been writing to this community. And what happened is people were being mean to them. He said it earlier in chapter two. He says, they're speaking against you as evildoers. Or he says later in chapter two that there's ignorance from foolish people. They're saying ignorant things about you and in doing that, slandering you. It was interesting. I read a report. I was just curious if anyone had ever done a survey on how people who are not Christians view Christians. I just wanted to see what it was. And uh, some of it was bad. Just FYI, some of it was pretty bad. Most of it was neutral. Most people answered, I don't know. But a surprising number said Christians, and they gave them a list of attributes, what what describes people with an association to Jesus. One of the attributes that people who had no allegiance to Jesus checked most often was selfish. Christians are selfish. Now, we talked about this the other day. Statistically speaking, people with an allegiance to Jesus Christ adopt children at twice the rate of the rest of America, give more, not just religious organizations, but secular organizations, the non-believing people, volunteer more, not just at religious organizations, but at secular organizations. So in every category where generosity is recorded, Christians lead the way. That's a fact. But the perception is that you're selfish. And perception can feel like reality, right? So you're slandered by ignorance, a lack of knowledge. How do you handle that? Well, you blast them on Twitter, Ben. You just light them up online, right? (laughs) No, on the contrary, you bless. That's hard to do. That's not easy. Do not repay evil for evil. That goes against every rap battle, gangster movie that we've ever been taught by. And yet, we're meant to go a different way. We don't revile when they revile. You don't insult someone back when they insult you. That's specifically, that's along party lines. This is a challenge. How much would social media change? What would we talk about? Some of you don't even know. You're like, if I obey this, I'm gonna lose my job. My whole job is to destroy the other. But he says, don't do it. Don't revile those who revile. Or later when he quotes the Psalm 34, he says, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Don't lie. Because uh, lying is a hateful thing to do. I'm gonna withhold information from you so you can't make an informed decision. And I'm gonna do it because it gets power from me. It's to my advantage to withhold truth from you so that your decisions will benefit me and my power. It's a terrible thing to lie, to deceive. And he says, the believer doesn't do it. We don't deceive, we don't revile. But on contrary, we bless. Most of us, if we're honest, can do the first one out of our own strength. If I really hammered you today and told you 14 stories, how when someone reviles you, don't revile back, some of you may begrudgingly say, okay, fine. And the next time someone says something rude to you, you go, okay, all right. Maybe when the third, fourth, seventh person cuts you off in traffic today, does something crazy, you don't honk. That'd be wild in this town. Oh, okay. I won't honk. Look at me being sanctified. (laughs) I won't revile. But if I say to you, yeah, now bless them. Say something great to them. Just bless them. Imagine now, picture in your mind, if you could, the 
the person on the other political party that you hate the most. I'll give you a second. Just, just picture their face. You know the contours of it. Now imagine blessing them. Praying they have a great weekend this weekend. Praying that God will bless their family, God will bless their finances, God will bless their heart. They'll have a great day. It gets stuck in your throat, doesn't it? Some of you are like, Ben, you just told us not to lie. Yes. So what happens? We've reached the limits of ourselves. That's the point. You can do the first one by discipline. Not revile back until later. Like, did you see, right? But to bless, that's supernatural. That's not normal. And here's the thing. We, we know it's good. We pay for that. We pay money for this. Captain America. How did he defeat the winter soldier, right? That happened in our city, right? I was driving someone the other day and it was like, hey, have you watched the Winter Soldier, that Marvel movie? Yeah, the Triskelton's right here, right? On Teddy Roosevelt Island, right? When they destroyed it, it would have destroyed my home, right? So uh, <laughs> how did Captain America defeat the Winter Soldier? Did he beat him up? No, he let him beat him up and he refused to retaliate. And in his refusing to retaliate, it broke Bucky's heart. And he realized, I need to repent and he became a good guy. And so an enemy became a friend because the good guy refused to retaliate because he saw the potential good in that guy. He's not just my enemy. There's something beautiful underneath all that distortion and lie. And I'm fighting for the real you. I'm fighting for the redeemed you. I'm fighting for the rescued you. I'm not fighting against you. I'm fighting for you. We see it and we love it. Spider-Man just taught us that. I refuse the paradigm where my enemy hits me and I got to hit back. My enemy's hitting me and I'm trying to bless and heal them, right? We pay for this, but then when it's our turn, we don't want to do it. We say, no, 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 that's because they're superheroes. If someone comes at me, I got to come back at them, right? And yet we're taught a different way. So let, let Mike Tyson teach us today before we get directly to the person of Jesus. Watched an interview the other way, Jeremy Piven. Some of you remember Jeremy Piven, the actor. He was in an interview, and he was asked about forgiveness. And he said, do you want to know who embodies forgiveness and compassion to me? He says, the person I've seen live it more than anyone else is Mike Tyson. And you're like, what? Because the Mike Tyson I remember scared grown men. Uh, what are you talking about, forgiveness and compassion? And he was saying this to a young man. And as he was saying this in this interview to this young man, the young man said, nah, man. He said, man, if somebody betrays me, if somebody hurts me, I cut ties. I don't forgive you. No. And you could tell the way he said it. His voice changed, dropped a little bit. It was like a hard thing to say. It's a tough thing to say. You come at me, doom on you, right? I cut you off. And then as he says that, the camera pans to the other side of the couch. And there's Mike Tyson sitting in the same room. And Mike Tyson says to the young man, then the devil wins. And the young man said, what? And then he gets offended. He says, you're telling me that if somebody hurts me, I'm supposed to be the, not cut ties, but be the bigger man and forgive them if they came at me first? And what Mike Tyson says is, so they're not your enemy, they're your master. Because they had control over your emotions. They changed you. He said, so they took something from you and you let them, because they can't change you unless you let them. And it's like, okay, that's different. We want to say, you revile me, I revile right back. But the question is, who's your master? Who are you following? Who are you leading? Who is directing your path? If it's a punch for a punch, an insult for an insult, you just look like the culture. And I poured a little poison in, but they poured it in purse. So I had to pour some back and they poured some. Well, guess what? You, you are still deciding to poison the well. Yeah. And so if the world's full of incivility, you don't need to keep scanning the horizon before you look in here. And the people of Jesus are meant to go a different way. Because why? Here's the reason. For to this you were called that you would obtain a blessing. What's he talking about there? He's given us perspective. How does this love we have within radiate out? Because you've got to look up and remember who's calling the shots. 
Who's our leader? Who do we key off of? Who called us onto his team? Well, you see it a couple verses earlier. He says in 1 Peter 2, 20, what credit is it if you sin and are beaten for it and you endure? But if you do good and suffer for it and you endure, that's a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example so you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sin in his body on that tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And by his wounds, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but now return to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. He says, look to Jesus. Look what he did. Can you imagine if Jesus Christ, when they spit on him, he spit back? Can you imagine if when they pulled the beard out of his face, if he said, will you just wait? I'll see you in hell. Can you imagine if while hanging on that cross, he cursed and spit like everyone else who was crucified by Rome did? Would we be talking about him now? And yet when reviled, he did not revile. When he hung there, he prayed for his enemies. And he continued to bless even the person on the cross next to him who had cursed him. He offered him paradise. And Roman soldiers at his feet said, that is the son of God. And a wake of blessing was unleashed on the world that has caught up all of us who've said yes to the grace of God in Jesus because Jesus chose a different way. And he says, the way I chose is what I called you to. If you follow a leader, you follow a leader. (laughs) And if Jesus Christ didn't revile, didn't deceive, but did good in the face of injustice, if we belong to him, we do the same. That's what we're called to that we may obtain a blessing. Now, that doesn't mean that we're earning a blessing. That word obtain there is inheritance, right? You don't work for an inheritance. You just get it. And so he said earlier in the letter that, hey, you've been born again by the grace of God, the mercy of God into an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. So if you put your faith in Jesus Christ and his kindness and mercy coming towards you, you are brought into his family and there's an inheritance waiting for you. And because you're in that family with that history and that trajectory, then it doesn't matter what they do. You're keying off of somebody else. You're following him. And in the same way that it changed the world for him, you have the possibility to be a change agent in your culture. I watched a video recently uh, about Don Richardson. Uh, He wrote a book years ago called Peace Child. And I remember I listened to his son speak and I had heard the story of Peace Child. And I, like many people, thought his son was the Peace Child. So we were like, I wanna come hear the Peace Child. And then this guy gets up there, this grown man, he's like, I'm not the Peace Child. And uh, it was a bad way to start a sermon. The guy had a rough uh, recovery, but he told the story of what did the Peace Child mean? Well, Don and Carol Richardson, 50 years ago, Uh, moved to Papua, the jungles among the Sawi tribe. And they moved there and the dad was learning the language so he could write a language, give him a written language and translate the scriptures. His mom uh, gave medical care to the community. So they did this because they wanted to show compassion in the name of Jesus among a people. So it was his husband, wife, and their seven-month-old child. And yet as they moved in among the Sawi tribe, they found that there were five tribes that were in a constant state of warfare and they were cannibals. And I won't show you the photos, but there are photos of there was constant uh, war against each other. And and when you were able to kill an enemy, you would eat parts of them and cut off their head. They were headhunters and you'd keep the skulls. So there's pictures of them with human skulls that they had collected and the constant retaliation. You kill one of us, we kill you right back. You take one of ours, we take two of yours. And five tribes were in a constant state of warfare, a constant lack of peace. And so Don and Carol finally said, hey, like we love being among you, but if we're constantly a threat of war, uh, we're gonna have to go. And the tribe told them, we don't want you to go. They had brought so much value to the community. We don't want you to leave. And they said, well, all this murdering of each other needs to stop. 
And yet this community didn't put their faith in Jesus. And so there wasn't this gospel motivation for forgiveness, but they understood, hey, we might lose this medical care, some of the resources they're providing. So they're like, okay, well, we'll make peace. And then the way they made peace, they pulled up an ancient uh, ritual. And one of the tribal chiefs grabbed his son and walked over to the other tribe and gave them his son. And that was a symbol of peace. I give you my child, he lives among you. He grows up among you. He becomes one of you. And I will never make war on you because you're now associated with my son. And he said, when they did that, that that act of blessing to come bring my most cherished possession to the people who had murdered my people, that kind of grace was transformative. And Don and Carol ultimately left as they were meant to do. They came with a message and let this community grow. But 50 years later, you can watch the video on YouTube. They came back and they said, you know what was the craziest thing? All the old people. They said, and the tribes kept talking about, we've never had old people, never really had gray hair. Men died too young. And yet suddenly these five tribes are friends. They intermarry and they got old people because they live and thrive together. And when he heard the story of the peace shot, when they saw that, he told them, that's what God has done for you. That God saw our rebellion against him and he gave his one and only son. God moved towards us with blessing while we were his enemies and it made an enemy into a friend. That's how we do it, right? And when they understood that, that that's what Jesus Christ, that heaven did that with earth, that God gave his son to make peace with us, they came to Christ. And it was that association with Christ that broke open a love among each other that dissolved the hate in their tribes. And let me tell you something, there's a possibility for the people of Jesus to dissolve the hate in the culture, but it's gonna be very personal. Can you bless instead of curse? Can you speak well of someone? And that word blessing is not just saying something kind to them. It's also Jesus said praying for those who persecute you. Some of you can't say anything nice to them yet. So just talk to God about them and see if God doesn't give you a heart for them. Uh, Karen Jobes, who wrote one of the best commentaries on this text, told the story of a uh, Christian soldier in the barracks and he's the only guy in his outfit that, that had faith in Christ and was made fun of it uh, for it. And one day, as he was in bed reading his Bible, a muddy boot hit him alongside the face. I don't know if you've ever gotten hit in the face. It has an instant connection to your anger lobe. I don't know how it works, but you know what I'm saying. You get hit in the face. That's very hard. He gets hit in the face as a Christian. What's the Christian going to do? What would you do? What he did was shine the guy's boots and put them at the end of his bed the next day. And men in that outfit came to Christ because they saw grace and mercy that isn't led by the culture, but can transform a culture. He's following a different leader, going a different way, and it can change things. I had a friend that had an opportunity years later to meet the man who had slept with his wife and caused their divorce. And that guy was in a terrible place in life. My buddy was telling me about all the wreckage in his life from their, the adultery and the, the loss. And I said, what'd you do? And he said, well, I got to meet him when he was in a very difficult place in life. I said, what'd you do? And he said, I came up to him and he was scared because he knew what he did to me. And I told him, and, and my friend's a big dude, so he needed to say this. I'm not gonna hurt you. And it's not because of you. It's because Jesus has changed my heart. And he shared the gospel with that guy. And that guy put his faith in Christ. And that guy's children get to know mercy and grace and love because love can turn enemies into friends, right? Abraham Lincoln taught us that. Martin Luther King taught us that. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, right? Love does that. And we're meant to love in the same way. So we do it because we follow a Christ who did it. That's the story we're on. And yet I'll be honest with you, as I drove my car and was angry at that person who hurt my feelings, even that wasn't enough. Normally it is. You think about how Jesus suffered for us, but I was like, yeah, but, but I still want to pay him back so bad. And then I read the last encouragement. He, he quotes the Psalm, whoever desires to love life and see good days. You want to see good, then you decide to put good in the system. You choose for you what you're going to do. doesn't matter what they do, whoever them is, you do good. 
So keep your tongue from evil. Keep your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil. Do good. Seek peace. That word is investigated. Find ways to be a peacemaker and then pursue it. I love that. Seek opportunities for peace and then pursue it. Look for ways to reweave the fabric of a broken society. Look for them. And as you do it in verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. That's the perspective in that last part. This system, love your enemies, I don't know that it really works if there's no God. And you're gonna have a hard time working that system if you don't believe in God, right? And if I tell you Jesus suffered for you, you go, well, he might've been an idiot. But if I say, but God runs this world and Jesus was the son of God and God sent Jesus like a lamb to the slaughter and when reviled, he didn't revile back, but he blessed and unlocked a, a wake of blessing. That's the story God's running. When you understand there's a God like that, I can follow this cause because I know who's in control. And that last part of this verse got me where he says, the Lord's eyes are on you, the righteous. Not those who do right, those who've been made right by the grace of Jesus. The eyes of the Lord are on you. It's not just that Jesus died for you long ago, as amazing as that is. It's that God sees you now. He's aware. You don't know what they said. Yes, I do, actually. I do. And I'm listening for your prayer. I will be just. That's where it ends. No one gets away with anything. Every sin will be paid for, either by Jesus on the cross or by an individual in hell. No one gets away with anything. And when you ponder the justice and severity of God, you praise him for his mercy. And you find when you ponder a God who's in control like that, you stop telling him, no, I have to get revenge. No, you don't. You stop telling him, no, I need to make him pay. No, you don't. If God didn't do that to me, if he was gracious to me, then I can be gracious to them. And as I was driving in my car and thought about that, God sees me now and God's aware that I need to talk to God about it and not talk to the hypothetical per version of that person in my brain. So I started telling God, they hurt my feelings. What they said was not true. I didn't like it. And as I said that, I thought, and I don't know where they're coming from and I don't know what they're going through, but I know they're made in your image and I know you care. And I know you hear their prayers in the watches of the night. And I know you're working on them. And I know you want me to love them. Gosh, darn it. And you know what? I don't need to spend a minute of my time trying to be justified in their eyes at all. The King of Kings loves me. God has a purpose in my life. God has called me to something great. I, I don't need to go try to seek out revenge. God's controlling the world. I can seek out loving the world. That's who I want to be. It's the choice I want to make. And it wasn't just the past grace of God, but the present sovereign grace of God that transformed my heart from petty to loving. And that's possible for you. And the world needs it. The world needs to see another way. You are not sufficient in yourselves, and yet God's grace is sufficient to heal your heart and to change other hearts because of you. How could this city be different if the people of Jesus embraced the grace of Jesus and shown the grace of Jesus? If we formed a raging hot flame of love and peace that radiated blessing out into the world. And when they hit us back, we outlast them with our suffering. We outlove their hate. What if we did it? You change the world that way. Jesus did. And the one who called us is calling us to walk in his path.